Ah, another draft physics video production. Today's version. Uh, anyway, it's just comments. And then we'll get on to something really interesting. Um, not probably. Anyway, Fractal Woman has made a video on magnetism. The missing, unveiling the missing secrets of magnetism. So Ken Wheeler style crap, ferrocell crap. She basically concedes the truth um, that the ferrocells an optical illusion and then goes on to talk all hyperboroid troidroid nonsense <laughs> just you know just saying these people are just too lost in their bullshit but anyway we'll get to that uh so mellow fortune this is just you know analyzing is there any point in speaking uh language is there any point in attempting to communicate with human beings and often it seems like no uh, physics is good in Mendham, but you really should play video games to stimulate your brain more. So I've already commented on video games. I'm sort of pro video games, but as I pointed out, anything in excess is no good for you. And so it's, um, you know, there's, there's, this is just typical what happens in politics and everything else. The asshole fringy lunatics ruin everything. So the uh, you know asshole everything should be free <laughs> um, i shouldn't be required to work idiots who think communes work or something um ruin socialism i mean they just ruin it uh, because they try to make it do more than it can do um and you'd say the right wing does the same thing the fringy the lunatic um i inherited mine why don't you get some inheritance um, assholes who just, you know, pull up your bootstraps, even though I never had to do any such thing, um, ruin uh, the whole idea of capitalism. Capitalism makes some sense if you don't sit there and give it away for free because of some genetic code. <laughs> you know, my, my kids are privileged. They get to cheat. Um, you know, it's just, just so stupid. Um, so no reasoning skills at all here and just ruins an argument just just makes me want to say fuck you fuck video games because obviously in the hands of assholes it's it's shit everything put in the hands of an asshole is turned into shit and um, that's all this asshole is demonstrating that you can't be trusted with anything because you'll turn everything into shit because you're stupid all right, video, video games are very productive. Well, this is just stupid. <laughs> you know, improving performance levels. In what way? Um, again, as stated, solving puzzles is good. Video games are a very good puzzle. Um, you know, they provide a very um, non-monotonous, non-tedious kind of puzzle to practice with. Um, and so that's good. That's the good part. Um, but again, you can't spend 70 hours a day playing, I mean a week playing video games and be productive. So it's just stupid with no downfall. So of course the downfall is you. You're an example of the downfall. A, an account with no content that, I don't know, is apparently something, some other message you're sending. Um, you like, you wish you have breasts or something. I don't know what this is. You know, you do the chick thing uh, as an icon when you're clearly probably not a chick. I play almost 70, 70 hours a week of gaming and I can see the benefits. You can see the benefits because you're not working. You're not doing anything. You're not, and that's the whole point, right? I mean, to have a civilization, people have to do things they don't want to do. That's the way it works. Uh, you know, it's just not going to be free. Somebody has to scrub the toilet. Somebody has to do all this crap work that kind of is crappy. And <laughs> you, you can't get people to do that for nothing. Retard. Anyway, so perv action comes to the rescue and tries to reason with the asshole, but there's no point. <clears throat> I don't know if you're trolling or not. Yes, well, who knows? Um, it's I think a troll wouldn't be smart enough to figure out how they're anti-video game, so they'll be pro-video game in a retarded way. So it's like you know the whatever the people playing those kind of games all over the place. You know, let's let's try okay to make the other side look bad by being pretending to be on their side and being a bad actor on their side. <laughs> you know, I mean, it's just so bad. Uh, I like to play a certain puzzle game while listening to the physics videos, and I feel it sharpens my restructuring abilities, whatever that means, but fine. Uh, practice makes perfect is all it comes down to, to me, so if you learn how to solve problems, and that's what video games are, it's just constantly imposing problems, 
um, that yes, yeah, you keep practicing doing that, then you'll start to learn how to figure out how to solve problems. You'll figure out why why does the Terminator come into the room and what keys him off and what sounds and do 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 and you figure out how it works and then you figure out how to manipulate it. That's exactly what I'm arguing for as being the whole point of having reasoning skills is to do exactly that, solve problems. All right, but you haven't provided even a single game to start with. <coughs> uh, makes you seem like a non-enthusiast and therefore a troll. <coughs> um, he's a troll because clearly the channel is not devoted to this subject in any way whatsoever, and this is just such erroneous nonsense. <coughs> Noisy opinions on games, which is, again, generally speaking, positive, but put in the hands of morons, it's a tool that's completely useless. Um, sledgehammers are great, but you just can't give them to any moron and say start hitting things. I feel like I have to come to, <clears throat> I have to come and limp dick, dickedly defend video games against the de decoding of the motherfucking reality. Um, I don't know exactly what that means. And then this preposterous number of hours you seem proud of. Yes, exactly. Well, proud of the fact that there's no content on his channel, right? He's telling me what I need to do. I have thousands of videos. F over 6,000, if you count my 10 years on other subjects. Tons of content. Um, you have nothing to show for your existence. I have plenty to show for mine. So why do I need your advice again? Oh, that's right. I don't need your advice. I'm the one who unifies physics. You're not the one doing that, are you? No. <laughs> so what, what the fucking use are you? I mean, it's just amazing. Look how productive I am. No, you're not productive, asshole. Do I want to invest more time in games? Question mark. Yes. Well, yes, because it's fun. Um, do I recognize that as of now there are way more direct ways to approach the world's problems? Well, and you're not going to really approach the problems of the world by just playing video games. And the fixing the world's problems is not going to be a fun game to play. Okay, the game's going to be, oh, shit, I have to cause some people discomfort to fix what they've broken. That's what it, the, the game is not going to be fun. Productivity. Uh, do you speak of it? Do you, yeah, do you have any concept of what the word means? Are you a bot, a bot designed to get me specifically? Um, go get shredded by Gary, you douche. Yeah, I wish I could shred. I wish I could squish people because they're obviously of no use to human civilization or our progress. Assholes making some generic statement that, uh, you know, video games are the perfect mechanism for life or something is just absolute nonsense. Or right, play some games you glean something out of and then make recommendations you troll. Um... I, yes, he could at least recommend. <laughs> yes. Um, I I just, you know, I don't really need games to do much. So I played Tomb Raider in the past, uh, long ago. The only video game I really messed with. And in race cars. I like to race car driving just because I like driving cars fast in simulations. Because simulations don't matter. Um, and... Um, but that's it. That's, you know, just, you know, I don't need anything more. <clears throat> I don't like shooting stuff particularly. Particularly. I mean, it has a taint to it. It just seems unnecessary. <laughs> you know. Uh, but anyway. Um, all right, so new comment. So, yes, I should just delete that other rubbish because it's just... This is just, I mean, I'd like to keep your response because it had some something to it, but this is just so off the fucking subject. Oh, God. All right. And, of course, I get thrown back again. All right, I like where this is going. So he's talking about the idea of getting to the idea that, uh, you know, the universe is just really pattern. You know, electron and proton, it doesn't really matter what they're made out of because... They're, they're essentially made out of the same stuff the field is made out of um, in terms of momentum. That's all they really contain is this quality of momentum, of stuff moving in a direction. And that's all you really need to know. And how does it change its direction? Uh, do you even have... You don't even have to hard comment to some assertions about directions and their averages. 
Well, I think it does come down to some pretty hard assertions about what creates attraction and repulsion, but regardless. Of course, it's nice <coughs> if you suckle out the marrow of the bones, yeah. but it's quite some uh, credibility risk for what I imagine to be very little clarity reward. Well, the clarity comes in the end, right? I mean, in the end, you get something really simple, you know, in the sense that you just get a pattern in a, in a matrix or whatever you want to call it, you know, in a deep field. Um, <clears throat> and you get the realization that that pattern can have durability if it's dense enough. If it's denser than the noise in the field, the pattern will just move around in the field. And um, conceptually, that's, um, when understood, uh, it's very powerful. Except if you perfectly nail the numbers, of course. Well, that's uh, that's the objective. Obviously, you're, you're obliged to do it. Um, and in a sense, you, you know, frankly, um, you don't need much evidence to, for it to be evidence. Your theory does have some leeway. I don't know what that means. And unfortunately, some fuzziness in shape of what I will now call the reflection bubble, not only in the big universe, but also within the atom. I, I don't see the leeway. Uh, the obligations to create the inverse square law, for example, are pretty strong obligations. Uh, especially if an atom model with multiple shells is the right answer. Well, I don't see how it's possible for it to be the right answer because it implies some other force, frankly. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, something to keep pushing electrons into orbits and then something to keep pushing the electrons. Uh, because as stated, fundamentally my theory says they can't keep going because of the fact that the field gets to the individual electrons. Uh, many reflection directions for trapping momentum. The point is, is the traps, so maybe that's worth, I don't know if it's worth drawing it, but the traps are, are layered, okay? Uh, much like an atom can be layered, the traps are layered. So the idea is that the electron and the proton, just imagine both here for the sake of argument, uh, the idea is is that they contain, they, they maintain a momentum that isn't true. That is, something when in the speed of light, it comes out in terms of this rolling motion, or whatever you want to say, this motion in this direction of this object is much, much slower. Okay, insanely slower. Uh, 10 to the 10th slower. Um, so something that was going somewhere doesn't get where it's going, quite obviously, is the argument. Because it's caught in a trap. All right, and so then the traps are themselves traps. So if I arrange these electrons and protons in arrangements, I can create another trap of motion, and then these electrons and protons can have motion, right? And so that's another trap um, <clears throat> of force. The force has to be in the trap. So there's force in here. That's what's getting trapped is force. There's force here, okay, and that's what's getting trapped, the force, all right, and this is where you eventually end up with this mc squared crap, okay, in terms of the energy. So the energy is this stuff, the stuff that's getting trapped, okay, that's going the speed of light, and then it stops going the speed of light because it's in a trap. It's going around and around and around and not going anywhere. So obviously this can represent the atom as a trap and then a bunch of atoms together can be a trap and so the traps can get bigger and they can hold a lot more force the bigger the trap the bigger the amount of force it can trap all right but that's all that's really happening is force should be somewhere if matter's not in the way and matter gets in the way and that's what changes the universe all right, but also within the atom, especially if the atom model were multiple shells, right? Okay, so I don't buy any of that. Um, my reflection directions for trapping momentum. Many reflection directions for trapping momentum. 
um, many forms of trap. So again, the argument is is that the trap doesn't have to be a circle. It doesn't, you know, a trap can be just having the idea that you throw something into a system, okay, where it's going to reflect back and forth. So it comes in and then it just reflects back and forth. Well, that trap still has this direction. So the trap, the whole trap, will move this way, but it'll move well. It'll move that way much slower, okay, than the speed of this. So this speed has been converted into a much slower speed held in the trap. And the idea is the more of this stuff you trap, obviously if you trap a whole bunch of this, all right, then when you finally get to the destination, you're gonna give it all back. So it's all conserved. Um, but all the harder to account for. So I don't think any of it's hard to account for. Uh, the harder part for me is to imagine is uh, the hardest part. Uh, what is force interacting with? So again, the fundamental argument. The argument I don't think I need to make at this point, but the point is that you get to ultimately is why does the universe change? What what makes the difference? And you know so. You're saying it's, uh, what's the force interacting with? It's interacting with itself. So the idea is that you can't see this interaction, right? This head-on collision is invisible because what you're gonna end up with is something going out and something going this way. And whether they hit each other or they miss each other, the diagram looks exactly the same. So if they reflect off of each other, or they miss each other, or <laughs> they go through each other. They're all the same. It's all the same universe. There's a thing going this way and a thing going that way. It's all the same. And the only way you can make a difference is if somehow these, these, these directions um, can have a character, a difference. And so if you have two forces, well then you can see the difference in the universe. And if the two forces have a different effect on each other, then you can see the difference, right? Because now missing looks completely different than hitting, okay? They're just different worlds. You can tell the difference between the two. Um, so the idea is, is the universe has got patterns in it. And so the electron would be essentially a pattern of, of black and red squares, or however you want to look at it, of, of direction, you know, and these are basically, it's a binary code of a sort, um, you know, uh, a, a, a bit code, you know, a four bit code, you know, you could cut it all down to or something. Um, and so all it is is a pattern, you know, it's a, and then with the, the pattern is durable, if it has certain rules, it obeys, right? And so you could say it has to obey some rule where the pattern has to have on, off, on, off, on, off, you know, different colors. You could say the pattern has to have some kind of something to it. And that pattern is floating around in this random field of stuff just flying in all kinds of directions. And the point is, is this stuff, when it interacts with this stuff, can change something, but it can't change it deeply. So it can't get into the deep part of the pattern. It can only get to the fringe of the pattern. So the durable part of the pattern remains, um, even though it changes in its momentum by a percentage, uh, you know, or a, an amount. But anyway, like I said, that's deeper than anybody needs to go, I think. Uh, it may not even be true, <laughs> but I'm just saying that I think that's ultimately where it's going to go. Uh, it would be four bits in a geometry, right? Yes, in, in, a, in a pattern. Uh, and what it's and what it's interesting with interacting with and what it's interacting with would have to be the size of one by one by one as well. No, obviously the plank thing comes up in the sense that the force is the plank. Ultimate, the ultimate plankness is the force. Since there is no evidence of forceless dead matter, yeah, I, I don't know what you're saying there. Um, I think there can be evidence of it. I think there's an electron that doesn't, the pattern isn't moving. So you'd sort of say it's kind of dead. Um, but obviously the field is, keeps interacting with it. You know, there's more heads at any one minute on one side of the universe than tails on the other side, blah, 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 blah. It's a decent conclusion to draw and that everything is made of four spits as you postulate. Well, good, so we agree on that. But to reduce the entire place of interaction to one or two chess boards, they're checkerboards, fields of one by one size is one hell of an imagination task. 
well, it's not that difficult to me anyway. Uh, I mean, I'm not finding it that difficult to understand the concept that you just have checkers and that you could take black and white checkers and if you arrange them correctly, you could create recognizable patterns like little fluffy duck or something. Um, one by one by implies chains of cube structure and I think it to have the stronger case than let's say another stable shape hexagonal order as found in carbon stuff. Yeah, well I'm just not buying the fact that these four spits are somehow all connected. So um, I think it is a fact that you they are just independent agents um, and it's not a ether of any kind. Um, but we got us. Uh, that's for uh, like I said, that's. I appreciate the comment. I appreciate your thinking, um, but like I said, I don't know if it's. I don't know if we're there yet to worry about um, analyzing that deep in terms of any necessity to go that deep. Uh, I watched a video by Paul M. Sutter on gravity and string theory and laughed quite a lot. Yeah, well, I don't know if let's see again. That doesn't really mean much to me. <laughs> lots of people laugh at lots of things and they shouldn't be laughing uh, still let us focus back I mean I would imagine I would find it um, a joke when they start comparing two completely made up concepts you know bent space and rubber band theory they shouldn't call it string theory they should just call it rubber band theory because they're basically just inventing the rubber band and saying rubber bands did it Still, let's focus back on the electron and tell me your perception of what an electron is. I've, I've gone into such detail about this, it just, this is just idiotic. I, clearly, I'm designating electrons and protons as inverse particles and that they have inverse properties. Exactly inverse. And the inverse part is how they react to the two kinds of force. So until you understand that there's two kinds of force, you really can't understand that there's two kinds of ways matter can interact with that force. So what's the point? Ugh, here are my assertions. Fine. An electron is more than an elementary particle. So you didn't even proofread your own statement, right? I mean, it just doesn't make any sense. The electron is more than an elementary particle. The whole point of elementary particles is to say you don't get moreness. You don't get more complex. You don't get something else inside of it. There's not a machine in there. There's not a brain inside my brain telling my brain how to work. My brain's doing it. The brain, okay, has the elemental properties in it, you could say, but my brain isn't elemental. All right, an electron has a complex inner structure, says you. Uh, it's clearly made of momentum. So you want to think it's made out of something else? Go ahead. But it's all just made out of momentum. And it has so much momentum in one direction. And it has so much in another direction. And so much in another direction. And when you add all of those up, it goes in one direction. So just like a boat with rowers, whatever way the rowers are rowing, the boat's going to go in effect. So if you have a big guy rowing that way and you have a little tiny guy rowing that way, guess which way you're going? <laughs> but anyway... <clears throat> Uh, an electron is a magnetic dipole when in motion. Well, I think that's just fucking retarded. I think there's absolutely no frickin' evidence from any experiment ever in the history of mankind showing an electron has a positive side somewhere, that it's really just got a half-proton side that never shows anybody. I think that's just bullshit. An electron is always negative, and the proton is always positive, and that's the way the two things come, and that's the way they work. So I think that's just, there's not a bit of evidence to indicate any reason to think uh, an electron is a dipole. <laughs> just no reason to believe it at all. An electron can be created from energy or destroyed. Well, again, you're making assertions, you're not going to back up with anything called evidence. So in accelerators anyway, they don't seem to be destroyed, they seem to be destroyers. I mean, they're sledgehammers hitting things. The sledgehammer doesn't fall apart. The thing it hits falls apart. 
So that's sort of the evidence. So I'm saying, again, there's nothing in your assertions. You don't explain why you believe anything you believe. You just assert things. Asserting things isn't of much value if there's no reasoning to defend the assertion. So again, you're just telling me this is the dogma I live by, and it's not common dogma. It's not like we, you can have any expectation that we have some shared impression, okay? Because you're not, it's, you're not saying something like... Um, Bowling balls are generally black. Well, we could both agree. Okay, generally speaking, yeah, they seem to be that way. That's how all the old balls are, and most people are dealing with the old. Maybe in the new modern bowling alley, they're mostly blue or something. But I'm just saying, you know, I'm, so I'm trying to use an example of something common to us all, that forks usually have four tines in them or something. You know, some statement from which we would have common experience. You're not citing anything from which there can be common experience, so it really just has to be... I, the only experience I think that's relevant is evidence. So again, you've got to defend statements by citing an experiment that demonstrates it to be true. You can't just say, this is what I believe. It's useless. You know, you're, you're attempting to stimulate a conversation with this vague crap that doesn't mean anything to me. Okay, it can't mean anything to me. And why you think I would have any, some? We, like I said, we have some shared perception when clearly we don't have any common uh, understanding because your universe is doing all kinds of things my universe doesn't do. I have no evidence that it does any of that crap. All right, so that would be it for comments. All right, so off to the ferro cell subject. All right, so uh, she starts off by just pointing out how the ferro cell is made, which is good. So it's a bunch of LEDs that can be different colors, not different colors, doesn't matter, blah, 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 blah. Two panes of glass and the fluid in between. Okay, and then she goes into some explanation of the fluid. Now, I don't know why she shows this stuff in the early part, because she's just, again, showing the bizarre uh, parts, you know, the, the weirdnesses without explaining that, oh, this is why it's weird. Um, all right, so this is one of the more important um, aspects is where, you know, they put the iron filings on top so you understand this is what it's really doing. It's exactly the same thing. So the ferrofluid is doing what a, a magnet would do if immersed in ferrofluid or when the filings are free to move. So you have to understand whenever you're looking at these patterns, it's because those are filings that aren't getting where they really want to be because they have friction with the paper or else the paper's above them and they can't get to the magnet. All right? so, and so it's completely dependent on a fake circumstance instead of not the real. You're not seeing something real. You're seeing something made okay, of a circumstance where they're not allowed. They're not free to do what they want to do, the little filing. Now, so what you should start with is a drawing of what's a magnet look like um, when the little iron filings are free. When the fi iron filings are free, um, this is what a magnet will look like, okay? It's not going to look anything like um, the, the, the bullshit um, example. And what it's going to look like is there's going to be a bunch of little filings in clearly uh, obvious pattern in the sense that they're all going to be connected to each other, okay, all the little filings are going to connect to each other and they're going to make little um, hairs, you could call it. All right, and that's what's going to happen. And it's going to happen on both ends. They're going to do exactly the same thing. And so that's what you're getting. That's the real pattern. That's the real field lines, if we want to call them that. Um, but that I, I call these the lines of force. If you want to see where the lines of force are, let the magnets do what they really want to do, and then they'll line up on the real lines of force, and they'll do exactly this. They'll do this radial thing. And that's the real diagram of a magnet. That's the real diagram of any forces that exist coming out of a magnet. And this stuff, you know, when they have these lines, these have nothing to do with, okay, the fact of the the actual force. So these are created because you're not allowing these little bits to do what they want to do. And because they can't do what they want to do, they have to just accept the field as it exists. And so you have to understand that what they're doing here is exactly so. They start off right. They start off saying, I'm going to put a magnet on top of that magnet. Okay, and so they have to go 
opposite subtract. So they start off, okay, in this configuration. And they just pile up on each other, okay, red, green, red, green. And, and the important thing to understand is that when they connect to each other sideways, you know, side by side, they also have to obey the red, green rule. This little magnet has to be the opposite of that little magnet. Now, they're not really the opposite. They're just, uh, you know, the bottom of this magnet is the top of that magnet, you see. So this is really the magnet, and this, so this wouldn't even exist. And so this is how they're going to line up. They're going to stagger, okay? <laughs> One's going to stagger on top of the next magnet, you know. And, um, you know, this being the real magnet. And that's how they're going to line up. That's the only way they can get next to each other, is they have to stagger themselves. Okay, but the point is, so you can clearly see that leaving, they're going to be blue, you know, I mean green, red, green, red. So they're going to be the same way this is. But obviously as they start making a chain, and now the chain is feeling, see it can't do what it wants to do, which is just shoot right into the magnet. You can't do that if you put a piece of paper in the way. So what you're going to see is, how does it line up? Well, it just lines up, keep doing this pattern over and over and over, and what do you get? Well, you end up with exactly um, the opposite as you started with. So you start off with green, red, right? And what are you going to end up with over here? Is you're going to end up with red, green, right? <laughs> yeah, it's got to be. Um, and and so it's going to create an opposite magnet. Oh, there. Okay, now you can see it. All right, so so green red turns into red green okay as the bottom one and the top one so you can just understand it, it inverts and then what are each one of these doing though is this creates a line of magnetism what's it doing it's creating lines of magnetism each one of these lines is going to be opposite magnets okay they're going to be the same magnets so they're going to be creating repulsion between each other and so that's why you end up with a separation between them but all this is just this line is completely arbitrary. It's not the real anything. It's just showing you which way magnets line up when they're in a magnetic field. It's not, it's not, it's not representing anything real. And it has some proportionality, though, to this idea of equal pressure. That is, there's an equal amount of magnetic attraction at this location, and then there'll be an equal amount at this location at all these different angles because that just has to do with the idea of the pressure between them. So the pressure between this, these two magnets until their their repulsion to each other is going to be proportional to the amount of field it's getting from the real magnet. So there's an equality in that distance in terms of the equal amount of force. But you have to understand what the force is made of and the force is going to be made of how much repulsion is coming from this direction, you know, how much repulsion is coming from this direction, how much attraction, you know, between the the red end and the green end. So I should have drawn that the other way. But anyway, the, so there's those four components, right? The attraction, the attraction between the opposites and then the repulsion between the sames coming from both directions. And that's the equalization of the pressure. So that's why you end up with these lines. So the lines aren't representing anything real. They're completely dependent on what you throw on the surface, how big the pieces are. Um, and the fact that there will be always proportionality, though, in the distances, because the distances have to do with how much magnetism you're creating from the original magnet at a distance. All right. But they're not representing anything called a force. There's no force moving this way, a force going around. Force. There's nothing doing that. It's just, uh, the, the, it's clearly just the relationship. And as stated, if they could turn, they're going to fly to one end or the other end, and they're going to just line up as magnets. <laughs> okay, end to end. All right. So then, all right, let's see what other images she uses. So, so now we're back to this. This is what the ferrofluid fluid actually is doing. Okay, and it's just like the iron filing picture in a sense. The suspension, um, because it's you know between two thin layers of glass, the little pieces can't go exactly where they want to go, so they're stuck just lining up with the field they're feeling. So they don't, 
you know, exactly go where they want to go, but they do exactly this. I mean, they pretty much, they are a lot freer than the traditional model. So you don't get any of these kind of lines in the ferrofluid. fluid. You know, these, the, the, <laughs> these toyroid things aren't happening at all. Okay, there's none of these kind of lines in the ferrofluid. fluid. It's all radial from one side or the other side, and that's it. You just have the radial force lines, like you see here. All right, um, and you don't even get this bending stuff. But anyway, um, so then she's talking about electromagnets, and that's okay, blah, blah, blah. Uh, like there's a difference in coils, which really wasn't the subject. Coils being the same as regular magnets, so that's what this is an image of, a coil. The magnetism created by a coil versus a regular magnet, and that they have the same field, blah, blah, blah. Well, looking under the ferrocell wouldn't be the best way to indicate that, but anyway, it doesn't matter. All right, and then she goes and uh, shows these images again of the holographic effect. And so then she explains um, the basic composition and the, you know, the coiloid dispersion, uh, a surfactant uh, that's basically something to keep all the little bits from sticking to each other so they don't clump. So it's in a way a little propulsive agent, a static electricity, okay? Basically you're giving the little magnet static electricity that's repulsive, a charge. So they repel each other. So they still are magnets and they want to get next to each other, but in a way they can't stick to each other. So that way the, the fluid doesn't clump. So it's like a non-clumping agent, as you can think of it. So it's a bunch of little tiny pieces of iron um, oxide. Um, and they're just prevented from sticking to each other. And that's the idea of it. Uh, it you know, sticking completely to each other. They can get right next to each other, but it can't stick. Uh, so they, when, once they're relaxed, you know, once you take the magnetic field away, the thermal energy of the fluid and everything else will cause them to rearrange very easily. Um, there's lots of currents, uh, so to speak, <laughs> to mix them up again. Um, all right, so just like I said, details about you know one to one thousand nanometers, which is kind of a huge range. Uh, the ferrule bits are actually pretty big. I mean, you can see them under a microscope um, pretty well, as I've demonstrated again, and other people have demonstrated. So if people are at all interested in this subject, they can find the microscopic images. And here's a microscopic image. It's close enough. I mean, she should show it from a out perspective so you could see that it's just lining up on the magnet in little straight lines little radial lines just like a sun shining all radial lines um, and that's the important fact okay and then she gets into this diffraction gradient and the point is is the light is passing through the different surfaces are next to each other the light passes through and it gets spread okay is the key point and that's why you're seeing the light so the ferro cell lights coming in this way it's hitting a bunch of little tiny particles that are lining up with each other but not sticking so they have some distance between each other between and they're also opposite magnets in a sense right because they're all being created by one magnetism so all the lines have a different magnetism so you're creating a bunch of uh, little little tiny slits and the slits are diffracting the light so it's making the light that's going sideways go up okay and so you see it and um, but you don't see it in every place because it depends on how the where the gaps are you know so the LED can only it only sees part of each line because of the angle being right you have to have the right angle going through to see it so you're not seeing anything that's really in the pattern under the cell you're seeing a little piece of it here 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 so you're seeing pieces of different parts of the pattern um, which e with each LED, and that's why you're getting these lines that are um, emergent. They're not they're not elemental. You're not seeing something elemental in the pattern. You're seeing something that emerges out of it um, based on the fact of the geometry of the diffraction. Now this is the important part. So here she's getting it. That okay, point charge. What do you see? Radial lines. This is the way, the only way to understand the actual force. So, so everything else is all bullshit, all right? If you want to, this is what a charge is, okay? It's just radiating that, in my opinion, is reflecting, but it doesn't really matter. 
okay it's <laughs> it's just radiating that's a charge okay and then you have another charge the opposite charge could be a, or, or you're the same charge or whatever um, and it's just doing the same thing just radiating uh, energy and you could just call one energy you could call one of them a drain and you can call the other one a light bulb or however you want to look at it one could be thought of as producing out pressure so you could put arrows on it if you want this one's an out and this one's an in you know and that's how you could look at it and that mostly works um, in terms of getting the idea that these are opposite forms of pressure um, inverse forms of pressure so then when they do this right well she'll start talking about um, um, whatever uh, Steinmetz drawings or something well the problem is is now they've changed the dotted lines and the solid lines so you can see in the image there's straight black lines and then little dotted red lines indicating fields well what they've done is take the dotted lines now are those black lines those black lines are now the field lines they're, they're telling you the pressure at each point so the idea to understand is is this would be an equal pressure um, and so so those lines are don't really indicate how they're just again an indication of how what would a magnet do if you stick it or a charge do if you stick it in this circumstance which way would it go all right and so that's all you're really doing so I can represent this thing and say look this is all equidistant and then I could say well what's going to happen if I put a charge right here is he's going to go perpendicular to that line and if I put it here he's going to go perpendicular to that line if there's nothing else around now, if there's something else around, he's going to go even more. So you can see that this one, because there's a drain over here, it's going to go tend to go towards the drain, right? So it's going to come out perpendicular, and but as it travels, it's going to be bent by the drain water and head in. So you can draw that line, but nothing actually travels that line unless you put a charge there and have it travel the line. The force is just this, and the force is just this. The force is just the drain okay and the water flow and that's the important thing so where's the currents well the currents are there's energy pushing this way and there's energy pushing this way so yes if I put something in here he's immediately gonna come off this way but very quickly the current going this way right is gonna push the boat this way so what does a boat do a boat leaves this way and it's gonna be bent by the drain this way so yeah, you can draw these lines that are crooked and funny, but they have nothing to do with the actual currents. This is creating the currents. These straight lines, Faraday even says straight line force. I mean, he says, look, it's got to be a straight line force for gravity and for this stuff. And so that's the concession. This is the real force. The real force is the straight line stuff. Um, and it only curves when you put a boat in uh, to be bent by it but until there's a boat to be bent by it there's no curves in it the curved path is just a composite of the two flows and the two flows are completely independent of each other so unlike water the molecules aren't doing any the water isn't doing any of this curving the water's explicitly just doing this and that all right and then you put something in there to do the math but it doesn't the force doesn't do the math the thing it's affecting does the math. So this is a real deception in this um, drawing. It's just that now they're changing the rules of what the lines represent. So he's taken the real force lines out and he's made two representations of what boats do, <laughs> you know, in a sense. Um, because this almost makes no sense. This dotted line is, is completely useless because it doesn't represent an equidistant of any kind of force. Um, in a sense it just doesn't have any relevance nothing's leaving it perpendicularly it's just not a proper line and, and again he's just basically made this the dotted line and he's taken out the real force because he's basically trying to add the forces he's forcing the forces to do something they don't do gravity doesn't do it none of the forces do it the force doesn't interact with the force the force affects the other object this object affects this object um, but it has to get to the object. There has to be an object it acts on. The force can only act on the electrons and the protons. It cannot act on it e itself. All right. 
and that's sort of back to the argument about the two arrows crashing into each other and not being able to see the effect. Uh, but I want to get into that. All right, so this is where she's getting close to the truth. This diagram is the truth, and so then she re-emphasizes that by pointing out, well, this is where Gola goes wrong. So in the middle of that showing the truth, she ends up showing this nonsense. Now, there's no diagram like this. Fi iron filings don't do anything like this. None of this exists as a real thing. So this is the horse shit, this, this Ken Wheeler, hyper Troy Lloyd bullshitty nonsense for which there's absolutely no evidence that anything's doing any of that. Um, again, if I put the magnet in a fluid, it just a bunch of radial lines at one end and a bunch of radial lines at the other end. And anytime they connect, you can understand why they create that arced line is because the magnetism they have is all repulsive. <laughs> and the only way they're gonna make that line is you have to create some barrier some reason why they can't just fly into the magnet because that's what they're going to want to do all right and so let's see what other images we have here so then this is where she points out that the paper by the guy who invented this ferro cell basically points out these facts that if you just change where you're shooting the light from you can completely change the patterns or completely different patterns uh, so if you shoot a laser beam from underneath or you, you know different things you'll get completely different patterns um, indicating that you're not really looking at the real thing you're just looking at uh, uh, distorted images uh, distortions of the reality uh, so it gets even more explicit in her terms of what arcs of light are created in the diffraction so if you shoot a laser in you get a certain line and then you get a certain circle um, and that those are created basically because I think more precisely because the light is of a different polarization than the LEDs but regardless it doesn't matter what the exact cause is she basically points out look if you take that composite of what the LEDs are doing then you can make this pattern okay and that each LED is creating one of these lines and each line is curved because it's reflecting off these off, off the real lines the real diffraction gradient is going in these directions so the the two slit experiments turn this way then the two slit experiments turn this way and the two slit experiments turn this way so it's turning the two slit experiment and then taking a composite of what it produces and the composite is just really one arc line is what you get in the end when you turn this the experiment in that 180 degree arc but then she goes back to this uh, uh, well this isn't the part where she goes to nonsense this was actually a good image here you know where she gets to this idea that it's these circles can be created by lots of these are natural effects to the atmosphere can create the same diffraction like a rainbow um, so nothing magical in that now this is where it gets important so she talks about this being a computer program and everything else and this is what the real lines of force are well again those are the lines just telling you what's equidistant so we're back to this crap again right the real lines are going this way this artificial line drawn is just telling you the, the distance you are from the center the strength of the force here is the same the strength is here the same the strength is here the same they're not real lines in real space they're just an, uh, an example of what the uh, equal where, where equal force arises um, and they're at the inverse square law so you can see that the outer ring is four times more than that in next ring and then that one's four times more than the, the other ring the thicknesses and so that's just a drawing of the inverse square law okay and so that's all that it is but she has the right idea right so she shows the iron filings doing the spiral thing and that's all there is there isn't anything else and the other lines are just arbitrarily drawn at the inverse square law rules just indicating to you that well this is how um, proportional the the field reduces but there's no actual lines there there's not some line in space that means anything you're just saying that this is where it comes out to a whole number three and this is where the line is a whole number five so so you're just <laughs> you're just or six because it would have to be no it'd be nine six three um, no, that's still not right. Uh, yeah, it has to be three, nine, twelve. Well, whatever the inverse square law does, you know, 
you figure it out. <laughs> I'm just saying those are the whole numbers representing the inverse square law. They're not. It doesn't mean anything. You could put the lines anywhere, and have them be proportionally um, four times more in more uh, circumference if it was a sphere. All right, and then so then she turns this into some sort of bizarre fractal crap. So this is where it all goes to hell. Um, so she has north and south indicate north and south, and so she sees a similarity uh, between the uh, mechanical pattern. But again, these are just synthetic lines. There's no real lines here. These are just lines of equidistant from the pressure, and that's it. Because you have to understand this: the the pressure to move, the impetus to move, is in conflict in these areas, right? So this, this, these circles should go right around the object. See, but she has now bent the lines. The lines don't actually bend. All you do is lukewarm. So now we're talking about where do you see purple light, right? So if it was blue light coming out of one end, red light coming out of the other end, where you see purple means that it's pushing and pulling. So obviously the force there, the, 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 the will to move is greatly reduced because you have two conflicting motivations. The, there's two ways to go, and so there's a lot of indecision about which way to go. Not indecision, wrong word. There's, you're getting pushed and pulled, um, and so you're not going to move as much because the two are opposite each other. Um, so then now they've distorted these lines, not to represent where the field, the actually field that the thing is producing is equal, now they've bent it as if the field adjusts to the other field, and it doesn't adjust to the other field. You have to put something in there to be pushed and pulled before their push and pull will change the shape of anything. So that's, again, a, a subtle but important mistake. So then she points, these are, this is the same thing here. You're just doing these, these are just artificial lines. Actually, she didn't say the word artificial, but these are the artificial ones. The round ones are artificial. The ones going radial, they're the ones really representing how the force actually behaves. All right. And this part just went right out of the ballpark. She just left the building. So she's going to now compare these um, images of, of electron orbitals. And now she's going to give the orbitals different colors as if they're protons and electrons, when clearly that's not what the orbitals are. The orbitals are electrons. It's all negative. So she's creating the illusion that electrons, because they have two orbitals, are somehow, now it's a negative electron or a double negative, I'm a positive electron, when it's not. The orbitals just mean there's a probability that it's going to be a left side or right side or, you know, that it does nothing. And I don't even, that's a whole pile of physics that has nothing really backing it up. Okay, the fact that they've changed how electrons orbit, they only did, you know, they've only done that to make other mathematics work. It isn't because they have some real evidence that electrons are in these different places. All right, um, and so she just takes this further and further, and just now she's comparing it to magnets, which have different plus and minus, the north and south poles of the magnets, and they're saying, well, look how much that looks like the orbitals of electrons. Well, electrons are all minus, 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 minus. They're all minus. There is no plus and minus relationship, so there's no way you can compare these. And uh, more illustration, she's put a plus sign and a minus sign on these things, actually indicating that somehow the electrons are plus and minus electrons. They're not plus and minus electrons. They're all minuses. So again, this doesn't, you know, this is, this is forcing the data to match when there is no match, um, you know, and just so she can play this game with her, again, this, this girly crap of, look, it looks like a flower. <laughs> you know, life is a flower. Uh, the universe is making flowers, uh, you know, it's just uh, silly. So anyway, so there was some good stuff in it in the sense that she got to the point that the the real pattern of the ferro cell is this. This is what the little bits are actually doing in the between the pieces of glass. They're making these little rays, lines. They're lining up on the actual lines of force. And um, there are no curved lines, there's no bent linear, there's no toroids. There's no evidence of a toroid there, right? No, no, no evidence that anything's doing this there. No evidence that anything's doing this. 
<laughs> right? No evidence of any of that. Just evidence of a radial force, rays of force leaving the object. Just like a sun burning, little rays of force. And when you see how strong the force is, you write a, draw a line. Oh, this is how strong the force is at this location. And then the next line you'll draw will be, you know, this this the whole four times smaller. You no, know, four times less circumference, and then four times less circumference, and then four times less circumference. And those will all be proportional in terms of it'll be half the distance and four times the change in the amount of force. Just like this hand, just like a light bulb, they all work the same way and they all work the same way because it's a straight line force and it radiates from points outward. The end. I mean, it, I, this really shouldn't have to be an argument. So anyway, so she's not she doesn't unveil any missing secret of magnetism. She just creates more misinformation by implying that somehow she can go from that diagram to that silly hyper burloid pile of shit nonsense. And there's no way to go from that to... Uh, I guess it was back. I thought it was right in, oh, right in there. Where the hell did it go? Where's the hyperburloid crap? Uh, is that the hyperburloid crap? It must be back here somewhere. Oh, that was it there, right? Yeah, there it is. All right, so you go from that, that really just telling you the truth. <laughs> That's the way it works. Radi rays that get weaker the further they go out because they have to cover more surface, the square. They're, they have to cover more surface this way and more surface this way, the same photon has to, the same lawn mower, the same how we want to look at it, has to, has to cut, you know, the square increase in the amount of surface. So, you know, as you go further away, there's more grass to cut, and the lawn mower gets uh, weaker, however you want to look at it. The, the thing you're throwing gets smaller and smaller as you go further out because it's got to be blended into a much larger thing. So if it was ink or it was anything else, the ink gets less and less potent the more fluid it has to dilute into. Um, I don't know, there's probably lots of analogies. So this, so what does this crap have to do with, you know, this? What does that crap have to do with this? Where is there any evidence of that crazy nonsense there? There's no evidence of it. And they just keep trying to force it to do this nonsense. Because they want the universe to be f flowers and, and wooey, fun, uh, bent lines. When it's not, we're the ones who are bending the lines. Nature's not doing it. All right, so enough. Um, Till the next time, such. But just so, unveiling the missing secret of magnetism. She just said secrets, but yeah, I guess she thinks there's only one secret. That somehow it's a fractaloid. So that, yeah, I should have gone all the way to the end where she, where's her fractal crap, yeah. So she has to try to turn it into this. So she takes something this simple and then says, you know, and tries to imply it has something to do with this crappy fractal crap. Anyway, you can't see it because it's zooming out, but whatever. It doesn't. So anyway, I mean, half good. At least she got to the... But she didn't even, like I said, she didn't directly go to it. Look, it's all an optical illusion. Um, what you see is not what you're getting, okay? It's it, What's really happening is much different than what appears that's happening. All right. She just said that right from the start and said the whole thing is misinformation, not real information. And then she, but then she, for her own purposes, turned it into a bunch of nonsense where she's trying to try to force electrons, um, positive and negative charged objects, to turn into, um, you know, whatever, butterflies. So, until the next time, enough, 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 and such. and so forth and whatnot.